Hello everyone, I am back today with a follow-up to my review on Mao's Great Famine by Frank DeCutter. This review is going to take on his book The Cultural Revolution, which was actually the third book in his set The People's Trilogy, but which also naturally follows in a sequence after Mao's Great Famine because chronologically uh, the end of the Great Leap Forward around 1962 leads right into the Cultural Revolution, which would characterize really the next 10 years of Chinese history. The topic of the Cultural Revolution is a challenging one, uh, in many ways still controversial today as it really impacted China's course of development. And also it's just perennially relevant because many of the themes and rhetoric used to support the Cultural Revolution at the time have been seen time and time again. But before we get into that, let me just summarize where we're at right now for those of you who, like me before uh, I read Mao's Great Famine, know very little about 20th century Chinese history and are a little lost placing these topics within a broader framework. Also, let me preemptively apologize that I am simply still not good at pronouncing Chinese names. I am going to try my best to pronounce them as similarly to how I've heard them pronounced by people who should know, but I'm still learning and I'm bound to get them pretty much all wrong. So in 1958, Chairman Mao Zedong, leader of the Chinese Communist Party, met with the head of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, and became acutely aware that his rival communist leader over in the Soviet Union was taking what Mao called a revisionist, or that is a soft approach to communism. Specifically, uh, Khrushchev was stepping back on some of the hardline early policies uh, of the Soviet Union and condemning some of the crimes of his predecessor, Joseph Stalin, a man who, despite Mao's rivalry with him for the leader of the communist world, had an iron grip on his empire and was working to shape a totalitarian state in a way that Mao really admired. And by totalitarian here, I specifically mean a society in which every part of an individual's life, even their personal life, was to be geared towards the strengthening of the state. I talk about that a little bit more in my review of the book Iron Curtain by Ann Applebaum, which I recommend a lot. So Mao was understandably more than a little bit nervous to hear Khrushchev suddenly condemning the policies of Stalin and the Soviet Union for the past 30-ish years because he perhaps correctly thought that this might be a dig at Mao's own personal style of leadership. Mao responded by launching the Great Leap Forward, which was basically this ambitious attempt that emulated the Soviet Union's early five-year plans and aimed to drastically scale up the Chinese economy within a period of just five years. And for more details on that, you'll have to check out my review of Mao's Great Famine, but basically in that book, DeCutter describes how this effort, not only in DeCutter's eyes, uh, but even in the eyes of many of Mao's own officials, ended up a complete disaster, resulting in widespread famine and costing tens of millions of lives in a way eerily similar to how Stalin's five-year plan likely brought about the Ukrainian famine of 1932 to 1933, which I talk about in another review of Ann Applebaum's Red Famine. I promise I'll stop referring to all my other reviews at this point, but there's a lot of good stuff to read about uh, for this period. So the Cultural Revolution, uh, the, the book and the historical movement, pick up where Mao's Great Famine left off. Here we have Mao somewhat disgraced by the failure of the Great Leap Forward and really rubbing many of his fellow Chinese Communist Party leaders the wrong way, but still highly revered and a clear favorite among the Chinese people. The Cultural Revolution is first and foremost a tale of Mao's brilliant but ruthless political calculation that mobilized the Chinese people under his de facto leadership, cemented his cult of personality or his status as basically a god-tier icon of Chinese society, and purged not just the party leadership but really many other spheres of society of anyone suspected to be showing revisionist or pseudo-capitalist tendencies, anyone struggling to hold on to the old ways and resist the onset of communism. Mao saw such resistance as inevitable in the creation of a communist society, but as something that needed to be dealt with strictly nevertheless. So in a series of rallies in the summer of 1966, Mao, in a cryptic sort of way that really seemed to be his trademark style and speeches, called upon what would come to be known as the Red Guard, largely college students or even younger students who were seen as the vanguard of Mao's new communist society, to mobilize in the defense of communism which roughly translated, at least in their interpretation, to going out and vandalizing property or threatening and often killing class enemies in a way that was often determined not by the victim's actual political actions, but simply because he or she belonged to the bourgeoisie class or one of the other maligned categories of people. And the full story of the Cultural Revolution includes a lot more than this alone, but these mass rallies on Tiananmen Square, followed by mass killings executed by the Red Guards, really formed the heart of the Cultural Revolution and are what many people first think of today when you mention the Cultural Revolution. I should add that the term Cultural Revolution can be a bit confusing at first, at least it was for me, because it involved a lot more intrigue than simply trying to shift the culture. But as I learned more about it, it really is a precise term because the idea was to dispose of the old traditional Chinese culture, the conservative traditions, uh, even the literature and history of China, 
to pave the way for a new vanguard of communist culture focused on the future instead of the past. And it also explains why Mao and his allies saw the youth as the leaders of this new culture, since in Mao's eyes, and probably correctly, they were not yet fully indoctrinated in the old and traditional ways of being. Uh, they were not yet incorrigible capitalist roaders. Now, perhaps it sounds like I'm casting a lot of judgment upon Mao's leadership and style right now, as Decatur tends to do in this book, but here it's not really my intention to tell you what was good or bad about this, but more to just give you an idea of the discussion surrounding it. For full transparency, I personally think the Cultural Revolution was pretty horrible in most regards and resulted in a lot of innocent victims, although I do think it's fascinating to explore it as a social phenomenon and to question how it managed to work as well as it did. We really have to take seriously the narratives and rhetoric and underlying societal frustrations that surrounded this period because we continue to see similar sentiments and lines of reasoning all the time. Now, if you saw my review of Mao's Great Famine, you'll know that although I was happy to have learned more about that period in history, I found the book as a whole to be overwhelming with statistics and details that were irrelevant to the average reader, myself included, and could have been a lot more to the point. I thought the general content was important, but the specific content was simply too much. But I was optimistic that the political discussions of the book, The Cultural Revolution, would be more interesting and fit better into a larger understanding. And they were, but only to a point. Um, I still found that Decoder's writing style in the Cultural Revolution was pretty far from what I prefer. Uh, it covered many key events, but in a way that was neither really captivating nor gave me enough of a broader context to understand the full context and relevance of everything going on. Again, it felt like as I read this book, I was hearing the names of all the key people. You know, Liu Xiaoqi, Zhuo Wenlai, Deng Xiaoping, Peng Dehuai, Kang Shang, Peng Zheng, Jiang Qing, Lin Biao. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sure I... Uh, butchered those names, but I did my best. Uh, I'm going to cut myself off there, though, because there are a lot of key players in this book, and many of them are really important to know because the interactions between them is central to the plot of the Cultural Revolution. The battle for the culture and for the future of China, even though it wasn't quite so essential to know all the key characters in the book about the Great Leap Forward. My point is that you'll hear a lot of names of key people, key events, and key places, but if you're not familiar with this time period, You'll have to do some considerable outside referencing to really have a clue what's going on because this is all complicated stuff and Decatur doesn't really make it easier for the casual historian here. The alliances between these figures are constantly changing and somewhat arbitrary since they're often as politically motivated as they are ideologically motivated, which is actually a big point of this book and of many discussions about the Cultural Revolution. But the result is that it can be incredibly difficult for a reader of this book to work out, for example, which factions of the Red Guards are opposed to which other ones, especially once the alliances start shifting and Mao starts condemning those whom he was just praising a few months earlier. So Decatur himself clearly knows the historical details well, but sometimes his writing comes across just a bit as sounding like, you know, that person in a conversation where you ask them something higher level, like, was the military in support of Mao or against him? And he responds, well, in Gansu province, one of the economically poorest regions, there was something, something revolt in which Mao had originally condemned, but then just a month later, due to pressures to oppose the capitalist rotors of that area, he reversed this assessment. And you're like, whoa, slow down a minute. Can we just talk first at more of a high level in a broad overview of how things progressed over time? And then, yes, let's then get down to the details in support of the more nuanced answer you just gave. Thus, I felt at many times that I was interested in the Cultural Revolution in spite of the way this book is narrated, rather than because of this book. I had already decided I wanted to learn some 20th century Chinese history, and since this book wasn't totally cutting it for me, I use it more as an indicator of where to look next. Let me just take a step back and say that I realize I'm getting fairly critical of the book at this point, but like I did for Mao's Great Famine, I really, really appreciate the original historical research and interviews that Decatur orchestrated and that went into this book. I just don't think all of it was presented as effectively as I would have liked to see. That said, this book might read totally differently for someone who does know quite a bit about that time period already and the key players, so I'd be really curious to hear how it's received by that sort of audience or even by professional historians. As for that outside referencing that helped me contextualize this book, though, I found two sources incredibly useful. The first source was one of my trusty uh, go-to sources. Uh, it's called Wikipedia. Uh, which, among other things, uh, just helped me square up who the characters were and even just like start to recognize their names and, and understand, you know, put names with faces. The second source, though, and one that I highly recommend, is a podcast series created by Laszlo Montgomery called the China History Podcast. This podcast covers a huge variety of topics in Chinese history, but among the many other topics, he did an eight-part series on the Cultural Revolution. And although eight parts might seem like a lot, 
Consider that at about 45 minutes a piece. In total, it's still less than half the length of the audiobook for Decatur's work. This podcast is absolutely fascinating. The presenter does an excellent job of narrating not only what's going on, but why it's going on, of making the characters feel not just like names on the page of a history book, but like actual living characters with real motivations and personalities. It'll still be challenging to learn all the many characters and stuff, and you might have to cross-reference or double-check uh, some of them to really remember who they are, I'm not gonna lie, but Laszlo does a, as good of a job as I could really imagine of making this clear. Uh, also from comments on his videos that seem to be by Chinese speakers, it appears that his pronunciation of Chinese names is actually quite accurate with the right tonality and everything. He clearly has studied Chinese and has professionally spoken the Chinese language for many years, so he clearly knows what he's doing. So if you're just learning about this topic for the first time, I'd really recommend starting with his podcast, or at the very least, using it as a companion while reading this book. In learning about China's cultural revolution and exploring the broader discussion around this period, it's hard to avoid seeing a lot of people comparing uh, this historical period with modern times. In particular, if I just search YouTube for a cultural revolution, as I did while preparing this review, I find a lot of videos claiming and elaborating on why they believe that, for example, the United States is in the midst of a cultural revolution. And to be more precise about these comparisons, what we're seeing here is mostly people on the right or center of the political spectrum saying that recent pushes by the left or far left of American society, pushes towards ideals that may or may not sound good in principle depending on the critic's point of view, are basically following similar tactics to Mao's Red Guard to purge society, or at least the mainstream society, of people who disagree with them, even if these disagreeing points of view aren't really exactly fringe or ultra-conservative. Examples of this might include cancel culture, uh, specifically the portion of cancel culture in which people on the center or right are targeted by people on the left or far left uh, for either intentionally expressing or accidentally conveying views that may have been deemed uh, unacceptable by those on the left. The implication here is that this is similar to China's cultural revolution because you have the accusers acting as judge, jury, and executioner. Or another example would be mass demonstrations that have toppled or destroyed public monuments that are now seen as representing the conservative elites, or more commonly lately, usually slavery and the Confederacy. Now, I personally don't want to proclaim anyone right or wrong here or delve too deeply into that question because, frankly, it could be a topic for a whole different video. But I did find it interesting while reading this book, particularly reading about the earlier stages of China's cultural revolution, to think about such questions. What I'd say, though, is first of all, I don't really think the United States is near a cultural revolution anywhere near what we saw in China. And I think it's important to avoid making alarmist statements uh, to get us out of tackling what may be valid and important concerns. And that's true even if these concerns are being advanced in ways that are illiberal. Like, if people on the left are fed up with racism and the lasting legacy of slavery in America, we can and probably should discuss whether toppling Confederate monuments is, is the best way to do this. Again, I don't mean to pass judgment on that either way right now, and I totally realize that there have been plenty of peaceful anti-racist protests over the past year that are probably more the norm but receive less attention since they're less sensational. But it is an important and interesting question of whether such change can be achieved within the current political system without kind of taking the law into one's own hands. It gets at this broader and really interesting question of whether societal change should be affected through reform, that is, within the legal system that already exists, or through revolution, which necessarily involves toppling not only statues, but the entire existing system as it is. Revolution is inherently unruly and messy and can be hard to keep from spiraling out of control. And yet, it may be the only option people have for bringing about change they want to see when the existing system is too resistant to reform. And tying this back to the book for a second, I think this is another of Decatur's failings here, in that although one might agree with him that the Cultural Revolution would have been better off never happening, he fails to really explore or legitimize the sentiments and imbalances in society that enabled something such as the Red Guard or the Cultural Revolution to emerge in the first place. Because these are the sorts of arguments that someone might still take today to argue that, look, there were some innocent victims of the Cultural Revolution, but ultimately this radical transformation of society was a good thing for the Chinese people. And some people do make these arguments, but you wouldn't know that from reading this book or really have any way of evaluating such a claim. On the other hand, I do think that these comparisons with the Cultural Revolution are apt in the sense that they challenge the means used to bring about societal change, whether through reform or revolution. 
In particular, using illiberal tactics to move society politically to the left may achieve the goal of society moving to the left, but as we saw in China in, in the earlier Soviet Union, it might set dangerous precedents that ultimately move society to the left in a socio-economic sense, but in a way that is profoundly illiberal in the sense that the freedom of expression and opinion and the like are no longer welcomed, and it becomes more of an authoritarian state. More specifically, purging or canceling people who disagree with us without giving them any chance to defend themselves, even if they express the most abhorrent views we've ever heard, may seem like a nice shortcut for getting to where we'd like to be, but the problem is, of course, that as we saw in China, one day's purger is the next day's purged. There are so many examples of this in the book that I can't even list them, so you'll have to read more about the period yourself if you want to see just how insecure things were in the top tiers of the CCP, or that is, the Chinese Communist Party. I guess I'll just wrap up these thoughts, though, with a quotation from the book that I think says it all. When bad people get beaten by good people, they deserve it. Do we want to live in a society where violence or purging or shunning is okay, as long as it's done by a good person to a bad person? Or maybe more to the point, do we want to live in a society in which people are binned into these binary but ever-shifting categories of bad and good people in the first place? In summary, Frank Decutter's The Cultural Revolution is an intriguing read and an adequate starting point, but like Mao's Great Famine, it often lacks the analytical depth that I would have liked to see. And I couldn't even say that this is because Decatur simply wants to let the facts speak for themselves, because there is a clear message uh, conveyed by the specific facts he presents and the way that he presents them, that the Cultural Revolution was an absolute disaster with little real merit. Decatur again expounds on what happened, but why it happened and what it actually means with a broader context is by and large left as an exercise to the reader. Still, it is an impressive collection of historical research and at least introduced me to a lot of really interesting and relevant events in recent Chinese history, as well as making me think about the nature of revolution, of culture, and how that all factors into modern debates. I can't say I'll be rushing out to read the last remaining piece of Decatur's trilogy, The Tragedy of Liberation. I do want to learn about this period encompassing the Chinese Civil War and the rise of Mao, but I think I'd prefer to start with another resource and then maybe check out Decatur's contribution only after I have a solid footing for this one. What do you think? Uh, do you have any suggestions of good books for learning about this period in Chinese history? I know there are not only a lot of good books focusing on a broader analysis, but also a number of memoirs from people who lived through this period, uh, including many former members of the Red Guard, which I think would be really interesting to read so I can understand the human dimension and the experience of the time period a bit more uh, beyond just the facts and figures. Uh, but for now, that's all I've got for today. If you like the video, don't forget to subscribe to see more history book reviews, but also a whole bunch of other stuff. And until next time, bye and happy reading.